Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. So we're going to continue this series uh, this morning. We call Dirt, where we're looking at the parable of the sower that Jesus taught. The parable of the sower is basically about how we all respond to truth when it's presented. Because every day in life, there's some truth that's presented to us that unfortunately, it makes us a little bit uncomfortable. You ever notice that people are like, well, the truth will set you free? Yes, it will. But oftentimes, it makes you very uncomfortable in the process. Anybody relate to that? Yeah. All right. So uh, do we get it working? Yes. All right. Cool, 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 cool. All right. So I, I, I live in, some of y'all know this, but I live in Kerrville. And uh, Kerrville is a retirement town. So you know what that means? There's a lot of people that are, that are just kind of, they're retired. So uh, what's interesting is as soon as I moved to Kerrville, my insurance went up. And I was like, why did my car insurance go up? Well, I quickly found out why. There are a lot of people in Kerrville that quite honestly probably should not be driving anymore. But nobody wants to have the talk with dad about taking his keys. You know that conversation? You know, well, he fought in Nam. I'm not going to talk to him about taking the keys, right? So, uh, and you know, China, if you ever had a situation where you, try, you realize your parents are getting too old to drive, you have to have the conversation with them and it doesn't usually go very well. And, you know, well, I pa- they'll say, like, well, I passed the driver's test. They're like, yeah, but, Dad, the driver's test only tests your vision. It doesn't test if you could actually turn your head to the left or to the right. So what I've found, in, in, like, in Kerrville is a lot of people, like, when they get to an intersection, because they can't turn their head to the left or the right, they just go, I'm coming out. <laughs> and all sorts of craziness ensues, which is also, I figured out, why Kerrville between my house and the highway, about I-10, there are, it's four miles, and there are 16 stoplights in that four miles. Yeah, you really have to depend on stoplights when you can't look to the left or the right. So apparently it's cutting down on, what the really crazy part about it is I called the city, and they're like, well, none of those are our stoplights. They all belong to the state. I'm like, are you kidding me? So somebody took the time to go through the bureaucracy of Austin to get us a stoplight here. So anyways, this is the town I live in. So what's crazy though is there's this H-E-B, a grocery store right next to my house where I see all the worst and most viciousness of humanity on display at this H-E-B. And it all revolves around handicap or disabled parking spots. Some of y'all are already nodding. You know where this is going. I have seen fights break out. Okay, and here's the crazy thing. There's like 20 parking spots there for the disabled and handicapped, but it, they're never available. So what happens is when people drive in, it's just it's this crazy free-for-all going for these handicapped spots. And uh, I watched, the first time I noticed it, there was two cars that had pulled in at the exact same time. And there's two older folks yelling at each other and one swinging his little blue handicapped parking thing like, I have this. And the other one's like, I do too. And they're fighting over who's going to get the handicapped spot. And I'm like, guys, like, just kind of, like, be nice or something, you know? Uh, another one I saw, this is the one I saw uh, just a couple weeks ago, and I was like, oh, my gosh, somebody's going to die in this parking lot. There was this sweet little older lady walking out with her shopping cart, and I'm watching as I'm coming out of the store. She's walking out to her car, to her handicapped spot, and there's a guy who sees somebody pulling out of a handicapped spot, and I see him like tunnel vision. I got to get that spot. So he starts speeding up, and he hits the lady's shopping cart. She's like, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is insane. He pulls into the handicapped spot, and the lady's like cleaning up herself. I'm like, this is just nuts. Like human nature over handicapped spots is like, people go primal. Have you you noticed that? Uh, here's what happened the other day. Elise and I were standing, you know how they line up the shopping carts, like rows of them? There's like five rows of shopping carts. And uh, Elise, my daughter, and I were standing there. Uh, I, th- I remember we were waiting for somebody. And a guy comes up behind me. He's like, you're getting in, you're in the way of the shopping carts. And I turn around, there's this guy with his oxygen in tow. And you know, I'm like, sir, there's four other rows of shopping carts. And he's like, you're at the one closest to the door. I was like, by a foot. And he yells at me, and I yelled at him, and it was a great example for my daughter. But (laughs) here's the thing. Have you noticed how when you've got like a need for something, you can get into this tunnel vision state, and you just kind of go primal? And and I think we all kind of, we don't say this out loud, but we think something like this. Well, 
yeah, I know I need to be more nice, but man, I got needs. Right? How about this? I know I shouldn't get so frazzled when somebody speaks to me with disrespect. But man, I'm a man. Men need respect. You don't talk to me that way. And you're always getting angry and fried about stuff, you know, people disrespecting you. And you, and you know deep inside the truth, like I shouldn't, this shouldn't bother me so much, but for some reason it just makes you go primal. Nobody relates. <laughs> How about this one? Man, I know I should be more generous and give, but man, it's really tight around the house right now and my family's got needs, man. We gotta provide for them. Well, here's one. I know I should not be looking at porn, but my wife and I right now, it's, 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 I got needs, man. And we justify all sorts of stuff because we got needs, man. Don't we? But it's so easy to fall into the trap of kind of giving up on the better angels of your nature, the stuff you know you should be doing, like you know this, just deep down inside. But you got needs, so we justify all sorts of behaviors because I got to get my needs met. And oftentimes we're just powering ahead, running over anybody that gets in our way because there's some need that's screaming at us so loud. And we look at people, and, and people look around and they're like, what's wrong with him? So my message today is called prickly because we've all got some areas in our life where we're a little bit prickly and if you touch that area, like the thorns are coming out. You're like a porcupine. You're like walking along, minding your own business and then somebody's like, pew, and you're pew. <laughs> And you got people you work with, you got people you work with, you're like, I know I do not go there with them on this because they're going to go pew. You're like, why do they get so triggered and like the thorns come out and we've been looking at this parable of the sower, and we're going to look today at the, it says the ground that's thorny ground. And we're going to look at what makes for thorny ground. So real quick rehash, uh, this whole series is basically about this question, how will you respond to truth when it's presented? And Jesus, you'll see in a second, he says, guys, this parable, if you don't get this parable, you're not going to get anything I'm going to say, because everything I'm saying is truth, and this is how people respond to truth. So he says, in parable, he starts off like this, he says to them, guys, don't you understand this parable? They're like, Jesus, what was that weird thing? You're like, sower, and there's dirt, and path, and all this. He says, how will you then understand all the parables? So let me explain it to you, make, make it really clear. The sower in the story is the guy who sows the word. He's the one who presents truth to you. Truth comes, and we've all had a moment where truth is revealed, and we go, oh. And we got to decide in that moment what we're going to do with it. Because again, the truth tends, it'll set you free, but it tends to make you really uncomfortable. Because you, when the truth is presented, if you're not living according to that truth, you have a tension in you. You go, well, I, I need to fix my life based on that truth. So there's these different ways we respond to it. And he says, these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. How does Satan take away truth? The only way he does it is one tool is through lies. Lies and deception. That's all he's got. That's his one tool and it works all the time. It's interesting that he calls it a path because you know how a path is formed? It's, how, it's a bunch of people going, this seems to be the easiest way to there. So one person takes it and then another's like, oh, that must be the easiest way. And then they follow it. And lies are always the easiest path to follow because Satan deals with them. But lies often make life easier for us to believe, at least temporarily. The thing with lies is challenging. is like if somebody tells you a lie... And you know the truth, but you want to, I mean, how often do we actually believe, a, people have been telling us the truth, but somebody offers us a lie and we take the lie instead. You know why? It's the easier path. One of the reasons is because if you believe the person who told you the lie, it, you abdicate your own responsibility. If things go south, you go, well, I just did what I, they told me was true, even though deep inside you knew. Some of y'all know that after your first marriage, right? <sighs> Mom warned me about him, but I lied to myself. Because it was just, well, I was in love. What, you know, what are you going to do about love? And we get in these situations where truth was presented to us, but we choose a lie instead. And honestly, a lie is the easier path. I talked about last week how some of us, we like, it's, some of us, we, did, we just, I mean, who wants to believe that the structure, the, a lot of the institutions we grew up, they say, well, well, you know, well, goodness, for goodness sake, why would the CDC not tell the whole truth? Or why would the government not tell the whole truth? Why would, why would they do that? Why would they lie? And, you, and it's a lot easier to believe that, that 
they're telling the truth, but really when the truth is presented, it's a lot easier to go on and say, well, I wouldn't believe that someone would tell a lie. And, and you end up missing out on what the truth of the situation is because it's scary to think that the people in charge would lie to you. But it's the truth. And it's also easier to abdicate responsibility when you say, well, I was just doing what they told me and I didn't know. You know, but really you did know deep inside when the truth is presented. And I'm not talking about when you've been truly deceived. I'm talking about when the truth has been presented, but you choose to look the other way because a lie is just the easier path. So the, the, the path response is to accept a lie rather than truth. But then there's this other one, right? And he says, and those sown on rocky ground, the ones when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. So these are the folks that, man, when you hear the good news of the gospel, gospel means good news. You go, this is amazing. Jesus saved me. He forgave all my sins, all the bad stuff I did. Like, I don't have to pay the price for that. I know I'm guilty, but God forgave me because of Jesus. And you rejoice and you celebrate. And it's so wonderful. And it's such a life-giving thing. And then you find out that love has two parts to it. One is not only that he forgave you, but then you also find out that Jesus loves you so much, he's not going to let you stay the same way you are. And so he starts going, hey, I, I need you to conquer this addiction over here. And you're like, ooh, and he's asking you to give up stuff. And you're like, well, this isn't cool. I thought we were rejoicing and celebrating that we're saved. Yes, you are, but that's just the beginning. That's the justification process. The next process is God taking you and transforming you into all he says you can be as you get yourself in line with his word and his truth. And that gets really hard. And this is where a lot of people drop off. They love the celebration part. God forgave me of my sins. Yes. And now he wants to take you and make you more like him. And that's the hard part where truth keeps coming and setting you free. But you're like, this is really uncomfortable and painful. And we talked last week about how the two ways that God, the two things God uses to, to transform us and open our mind to a new awareness of him are an experience of great love and an experience of great suffering. If you think about it, the times that you've, been awakened the most to more of what's in you or more of who God is, it's usually through great love or great suffering. And if you think about what is the cross an image of, it's an image of great love and great suffering all in one image, which is the power of the image of the cross. Jesus came and he loved you so much that he suffered and died in your place. And so we grow through times of great love and great suffering, but more often than not, if you're like me, it's usually through great suffering. Suffering just wakes you up and you go, oh my gosh, I got to like, I got to pay attention here. So that's how Paul can say something as ridiculous as we rejoice in the suffering that we go through because we know suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Now, again, there's, there's unnecessary suffering, which is just created by the dumb stuff we do. Anybody had some unnecessary suffering in your life? I have. You just don't use God's wisdom and you go, oh. And, but then there's necessary suffering. And that's the stuff that God allows into your life that he uses to transform you. And that's how he does it. So the, the path, the, the stony ground response is to give up and walk away when it gets difficult because there's this verse, unfortunately, in Acts, I wish it wasn't in there. It says, through much suffering, we enter the kingdom of God. For whatever reason, God has chosen, chosen to use suffering to get us where he wants us to go. I wish he would have said, through much Krispy Kreme, we enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> but he didn't. He said, through suffering. And so we grow through that. Well, then there's this third response, which is what we're going to talk to, about today to the truth when it's presented. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So we've all got these needs in life. And what's fascinating is Jesus, when, he, when God became a man, he suffered and he felt all of the challenges and pain we felt. And there's this story where Jesus, right before he began his ministry, it says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So Satan, or Jesus feels like it's time to, for him to start his ministry. He goes and he does not eat food. This is literally, he did not eat food for 40 days. And for obvious reasons, he was hungry. He had needs. He was a human. And the tempter came and said to him, if you're the son of God, get your needs met. Command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus' response is fascinating. He says, it's written, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What he's saying here is there are some things that are way more important than your basic needs. 
there are spiritual things that are way more important than your basic needs. And the thorn response is this, to get distracted by lesser things. And it's super easy because your needs, the things you need, are constantly screaming at you. And if you narrow it down, there's basically three things we're all looking for. Now, if you've heard me talk for more than about 20 minutes, you've heard me talk about this triangle. Some of you, this is completely like, I've heard this. Some of you, this is brand new. If this is brand new to you, I'm going to blow through this. There's a whole book in the back I wrote about it called Fully You. It's available in the back. You can get it, okay? But there's three basic needs that every human has. The things that are screaming at you all the time. It's a need for safety. You need security. That may be financial security. Maybe it's emotional security, relational security. You need a guarantee that you're going to be safe. We all need connection. A sense of connection is feeling esteemed, seen, heard, valued. You need to know that you've got, you're important to somebody. And then the third area is the area of empowerment. Empowerment is just this idea of having some say and control in your decisions. And if you think about it, listen, God made you to need all these things. He made you, but he made you to need these things and get the fulfillment of them in him. So in the Garden of Eden, they had all this. They had perfect safety. There was no sin, nothing to harm them. They had perfect connection. God hung out with them in the cool of the day, it says. And they had perfect empowerment. He's like, you guys got the run of the place. Just don't do one thing. But the minute they did the one thing they weren't supposed to, they felt a break, a separation of getting their needs met from God and his love. And ever since then, we've all been running around needing different things. And when we don't get the safety we need, we end up feeling abandonment. Fear of abandonment becomes a primary drive within us. I just, as long as I don't, I'm not alone and abandoned. If you don't get connection, the fear becomes rejection. And rejection is just a driving thing. We're like, I, I had a guy say one time, he's like, well, I never feel like a fear of rejection. I just reject people before they have a chance to reject me. So drive for rejection. And then there's me. I'm in this corner over here, empowerment, okay? My greatest fear is not having control over a situation or the great fear of being humiliated or embarrassed. So here's where the prickly part comes in. If you want to figure out what it is you're seeking, the parking spot, so to say, that you're always driving around looking for tunnel vision and see as soon as you see one open, you'll run over whoever it takes to get there. You ask yourself, which one of these makes you sensitive when you don't get it. So for me, if you want to see me get real prickly, pop up like a porcupine, threaten my empowerment. I can get ungodly in a hurry. <laughs> there was a guy the other day, went to Ikea. After the whole thing went down, I probably should have apologized, but it was getting late. So uh, <laughs> we walk up, you know, Ikea has these huge ginormous warehouse where all the stuff is stored, right? And we go in there and there's this one aisle that I can't get to. It has a shelf I need. And there's a gate in front of it. And an Ikea agent has a mask over his whole face. And he's like, uh, and I was like, hey, um, can I use that cart back there to, to get a shelf? And he's like, no, you have to get the carts from the front of the store. So Emily, Miss Compliant, she's like, okay, I'll run up there. So she runs up to get it. I'm standing there waiting. My wife has to run all the way to the front of this ginormous, you know, whatever it is, 40, 100,000 square feet. Uh, and she finally, anyways, so she's out there and I was like, well, look, I don't know what's taking her so long, but can I at least get the shelf down so I can get things in motion so when she gets back, we can, you know, load it up? And he goes, oh, you want to get back here? And I was like, yeah. He said, well, you can use the cart. I was like, you freaking idiot. Like, what do you think I'm doing standing here? You made me look stupid standing here. And I went off on the guy and it wasn't pretty. And I'm sorry for it. Lord, let him know I'm sorry, please. But it threatened my sense of control. And I was kind of embarrassed because I was standing there like an idiot. So what, what is it that makes you prickly? Is it, is it the safety thing? When you feel abandoned by somebody, you just, oh, and you, psh, the thorns come out, and you, you, you lose sight of higher things because you're so focused on your own safety. Maybe it's for you, it's connection, man. Whenever you feel like you're about to get rejected, the thorns come out, and nobody's even rejecting you, but man, I've talked to people that are like, man, every time there's any small conflict, she runs from the relationship. It's a fear of rejection. The thorns come out and you get prickly. So what is it that makes you prickly? Because that's that gaping wound, that hole within you, is that parking spot you're looking for. 
And whenever you see something that offers it, you'll run to it as fast as you can. Which is why a lot of times I see people that say, yeah, I know it's, a, it's, I know it's an abusive relationship, but man, he, sure, he offers me safety. I know he's never going to leave me. And I won't leave him for that. But yet it's just a horribly abusive relationship. Or maybe over here, your need is, is to just feel valued and you f- need to feel needed. That's the, the parking spot you're looking for. And anytime you see somebody that says, well, they need me. I see people that jump from church to church to church for this reason. Because like, well, they need me over there. Really? Is that what it is? Or are you just kind of afraid to get connected here? Because when people start getting up in your business, it gets uncomfortable, right? Maybe sometimes you don't need to be needed. Maybe sometimes you just need to sit under the word of God and let it teach you and you grow in this season, right? And this is, I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road, guys, because every one of us, one of these is our sensitive spot. Maybe two or three of them is your sensitive spot. Maybe. Depends, man. You may have had an experience of not getting any of those things growing up, and so you're perpetually focused on that. And this is the real life stuff where Jesus says, look, you can really like miss sight of the higher things in life because you're so focused on your needs. And this is real stuff. You know, our, our, our motto here at, at Crossroads, Pastor Marcus and Natalie have created this culture of real God, real people. And I actually had somebody come up to me last week and said, man, you're just like really real when you talk about this stuff. I'm like, you know why I'm really real? Because this stuff's really real to me. If this stuff isn't really real and you're not implementing it in your life, what are we doing here this morning? Let's all go to the lake. This is a total waste of time so you don't get credit from God just for showing up at church. The goal here is to learn stuff that transforms your life and gets you in line with him. I mean, let's just be honest. If this is just to show up at church, we're wasting our time. Yeah. yeah. Stop clapping. Stop clapping. (laughs) Seriously, though. And so we were like, what's so real to you? I'm like, because it has been real to me. Because here's my challenge. Every time I get prickly... I have to go, what's the truth in this situation? And then I have to surrender myself to it. And that's the really hard part. Because I've got needs, man. I need control. And God's like, the only control you're ever going to get is coming from me. So he goes on and he says, so some people get hung up on the needs. And they, they lose sight of the higher things. And listen, let me ask you something. What better do you have to do with your time than to seek something higher than your basic needs? Because the basic needs are never going to go away. But Jesus offers the answer. He says, seek my kingdom first and my righteousness, and I'll take care of all that stuff for you. I'll take care of it. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. But it's having the right aim. So then he goes on and he says this. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, they're worried about the worries of this life. Some, it's the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things that come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And the deceitfulness of wealth is interesting because wealth can promise to give you those three things. Security, connection, empowerment, but it's deceitful. Because have you ever noticed that like you can build a bigger wall around your house, but you still won't feel safe if your safety doesn't come from somewhere other than the wall? You can add another security camera. That's me. We've got this big 16 acres, and I'm constantly adding security cameras. And I'm like, wait, there's a gap over there I can't see. And my wife's like, sweetheart, just we don't need any more security cameras. I'm like, one more. But it's this delusion, right? And wealth can promise you like more safety. But have you ever noticed it's like a self-perpetuating cycle? You get, you get a bigger house. I have a friend and he bought this huge house the other day. And he's like, it's so amazing. I bought this big house. And then the HOA wrote and said, by the way, you have to have a new yard in by the end of this month. And it has to have this kind of a sprinkler system. And it was $100,000 for all that. And he's like, ouch, this house that was a $900,000 house just turned into a million dollar house because of the yard. You ever notice you get a nicer car and your insurance goes up? Nowadays, you get a cheaper car and your insurance goes up. But it's just this perpetuating cycle. I have this this guy I know, and if if I said his name, you'd know him. His name is on stuff all over town here. And he said, you know, one of the biggest problems with wealth is this. He said, I spend 90% of my day with lawyers and CPAs trying to figure out how to keep people from taking my money. As a famous philosopher once said, more money, more problems. It's for real. Like, that, that's a rapper, by the way. I wasn't a philosopher. But <laughs> it's deceitful. Money is deceitful. So that's why Jesus said this. He said, Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say it's pos- impossible, but he says it's difficult. He says, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle 
than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now listen, there is nothing wrong with money. The Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And money just reveals what was already in your heart. Yeah. And I had a, one of the things I realized about this verse is an old cowboy once told me this. He said this. He said, the only difference between the rich and the poor is the rich get a longer rope to hang themselves with. I thought, what does that mean? And here's what I, I, I realize he, mean, he means by that. We all make the same dumb mistakes. But when you got money, you can buffer yourself from the pain of those mistakes. We all got the same struggles. But when you got money, you can buffer yourself from those struggles. And what's fascinating, this is where Jesus says this, what is it that God uses to transform us most of the time? It's suffering. And when you've got money to buffer yourself from suffering, you're not going to grow in the way that God wants you to grow because your money can buy you out of some of the suffering. I think about the single mother struggling, trying to figure out how to work and tear, care for her three kids. It's a constant struggle, right? And God's with her and growing with her with her. But man, if you're wealthy, you don't have that problem. You just hire a nanny. Money buffers you from the suffering of life. And that's why it makes it hard, but it's deceitful. Because again, with more money comes more problems. And there are so many people that get so caught up in the love of money that they actually miss out on spiritual growth because they feel like that money is going to offer the security or the connection or the empowerment that they need. And listen, men, I've talked to so many men, successful, powerful businessmen, and what's driving them is they just say, I just don't want to be poor. I can't be poor. I grew up poor and I don't want that to happen ever again. And they say it's for their family, but really what it is is just this driving need in them to not be poor. And what they'll do is, man, that, that, it's that gaping hole, it's that empty parking spot they see over there and like, I need that spot. And they'll run over anybody that it takes to get to that money. And you go, well, how are you going to know when you're not poor? Well, I just need a little bit more. And it's just perpetuating cycle because you're so afraid of being poor that it's driving you and you actually are doing ungodly things, justifying it in the name of caring for your family and not being poor. And it's so easy to lie to yourself and go, yeah, I'm doing it for for my family. No, it's because you're terrified of being poor. And again, this money thing is tricky because some of the some of the greediest people I know are actually poor. The question is, does the money control you? And Jesus is saying, look, you can love God, but you can lose sight of the higher things he calls you to because you just you believe the money's going to buy you out of out of it. Now, as some of the loneliest people I know are wealthy people. They don't know who their friends really are because they're like, well, I buy them everything. So I don't know if they want me because of my money or because that. And we often think money's going to be the answer, but it's not. Jesus is saying, no, the higher thing is to stop looking at your needs and look to me for your security, for your sense of connection, whether that's emotional, relational connection, whether that's emotional safety, relational safety, physical safety. You're only going to find that in God's love. And that's where Jesus, I love this verse here. It says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The truth will present itself and it's so easy to get so tunnel focused on getting our needs met. And the truth is calling out to you saying, no, if you really want those needs met, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those needs will be met for you. So this morning, which one of those was your sensitive area? Which one's the one that makes you prickly? that you're just really prone to forget spiritual things when the physical thing is calling out to you. Maybe it's a desperate need for just to not be alone. So you're just bouncing from person to person to person so you're not alone. Maybe it's a desperate need for security. And let me just tell you, man, no amount of money in the bank, no wall, no amount of security cameras, no amount of commitment from a spouse is gonna be, uh, give you enough security if that's that gaping hole you're, you're looking for, that parking spot in your heart. Pascal, he said it this way. He said, there's a God-shaped hole in all of us that can only be filled by God himself. That parking spot you're gunning for, only God can fill that. So this morning, I would just encourage you guys, listen, it sounds so simple, but the security you're looking for, the sense of esteem and value and importance, the sense of empowerment that you're looking for, is only going to come as you surrender yourself to God's way. Say, God, give me your truth 
and I'm going to stop focusing on my needs and justifying why I should do this even though it's not the right thing because of my needs and I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to trust that you're all I need and I don't listen I don't know how it works but I'm telling you this stuff is real to me right here I have to do this every day you get up in the morning and and you say God I'm giving it to you I'm giving my sense of control of this situation to you because really you're the only one that's in control of the situation your, your desire to, to, for love and that gaping hole of just feeling like you're not enough, give that to him. That desire for security, give that to him. No government can give it to you. No amount of money can give it to you. Only God can give it to you. It's found in him. And I don't understand the magic of how it all works. It's not magic, it's faith. I don't understand how it works. But he does. If He says, if you'll seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, rather than being so laser focused on getting your needs met, lift your vision higher. And he will provide everything you need according to his riches. And he's really rich. He's got everything you need. Stop focusing on your needs. Stop focusing on the deceitfulness of wealth that you think, if I can just get a little bit more, it's going to solve all my problems. It won't. Only God is the answer. And it's so simplistic, but it's so complicated because it's so hard. Because we're prickly. We all got that stuff that triggers us. But if you'll do this, man, I'm telling you, there is no limit to how high God can take you. He wants to take you places and says it's exceedingly abundantly far above all you could ever ask or think according to his power that's at work within you. As you accept his power to live in this life, for his, sen- his power to give you the security connection and empowerment you need that comes from him, you're going to find yourself going places you never could have imagined, feeling a sense of confidence you never could have imagined because you've got the right aim and you're seeking him. And he will provide everything you need in all of your needs. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you this morning that you are with us. You know our needs. You made us to need those things. And I thank you, Lord, you are the perfect fulfillment of those. So I pray for those this morning that, man, maybe the gaping hole, that parking spot they're always gunning for and running over people to get it is a sense of safety, Lord. They've been afraid to take some risks they need to take, Lord. I pray that they would just surrender that to you and say, Lord, you're going to provide my needs. I'm not going to get distracted by my needs. I'm going to focus on you. Lift my vision higher. For those that are, it's the connection thing, man. It's just a gaping hole of not feeling like they're enough or feeling rejected or feeling like nobody loves them or they're unloved. I pray, Lord, that they would just begin to love, realize they are deeply loved by you. And for those, for me, <laughs> that are always looking to control things, Lord, I pray that we would just see that you are the one in ultimate control and we can trust your control of the situation. So we surrender it to you and we get our attitude in the right place. And we believe you will supply all of our needs. We're not going to get distracted and let our needs get in the way of us seeking truth. If you're here this morning and you have not given your life to Jesus, I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, it's going to be the first step on the journey to walking with Jesus. If you, uh, let's, say this all, let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way and we turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Man. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you in the back. Uh, you can stand or you can sit, whatever you want. Um, every Monday, I send out a really short, encouraging email. If you want to get signed up for that, a lot of people, I, I just forget to announce that I have that. If you want to sign up for that, just scan that and fill in the blanks there. And uh, we will see you guys next week. You are dismissed. Have a great week. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.